Yes, I'm ready. Awesome. All right. Welcome. Welcome, guys. Welcome to um, join um, the, the up to date COVID edition, the episode six. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, Asian discrimination perspective. And we have the pleasure to have um, Dr. Jason Oliver Chan from the University of uh, Connecticut. And um, today's um, the topic is presented by the Asian Pharmacists Association. Mission Indian Pharmacists Association, um, Infectious Disease Student Pharmacists Association, uh, and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Oh, well, that was multiple. And um, so, just a little bit of background about Dr. Chan. Um, he is Associate Professor of History and Asian, Asian and Asian American Studies. He also served as a Director of Asian and Asian American Studies Institutes at the University of Connecticut. Um, he teaches history courses in Asian American studies, comparative ethics studies, and mar maritime studies. With a PhD in ethics study from UC Berkeley and a public policy degree from UMass Amherst, Professor Chen is committed to interdisciplinary scholarship and engaging in committee relevant research. Um, let's please give a, a round of applause uh, for Dr. Chen. I know you, I, I know I can't hear this, but uh, please see <laughs> and welcome. And just a kind of a reminder for every, for all the audience, um, if you have any question along like doing this um, live discussion, please feel free um, just to post in the chat. Uh, we have a few moderators, uh, just we, we will be uh, moderating your um, question. So feel free to post that at any time. So um, Dr. Chen, you have anything to add before we get started? Uh, I just want to thank you, Peter, and, uh, and all the other co-sponsors who helped uh, make this happen. Uh, I think this is a, um, an important conversation, and I'm really grateful that you reached out. Um, and uh, I think this is a um, fantastic opportunity to uh, talk about uh, not only this history and, uh, and our current situation, but also the relationship between Asian American studies as a field and, uh, and the sciences uh, and professional uh, degree programs. Uh, so hopefully we can we can maybe talk about that um, too. Uh, but thank you. I'll let you um, carry the day. Yeah, awesome. And um, I, I'm not sure. I, I cannot see you. Did you uh, mute the camera or? Did you no. the... do you, do, should, should I mute the camera? Uh, no, of course not. But I just uh, I'm not seeing like you in person. So I'm just wondering if you, did you turn off the camera or? Oh no. Um, it does say that the camera is on. Um, oh, okay. So myself in a little tiny window. Okay, I see. You might be just me then, because uh, maybe because I'm presenting. But okay, okay. Let's get started. Okay. Um, sorry cool. about the glitch. No. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. So we're gonna jump into question one. And um, so the first question we have for Dr. Chen is: um, Can you share when you first started noticing the reports of Asian and Asian American discrimination? Yeah. So. Um, so with this, our, with our current episode of the COVID-19, um, I started observing negative portrayals of Asians almost immediately. Um, I mean, we can, if, if you can even remember now, um, uh, around the time of Lunar New Year, which I think was around January 25th, uh, there were already um, uh, widely circulated negative and racialized memes that, um, that were uh, pointing out a the, the characteriz the predominant characterization is that uh, Chinese in particular and Asians in general are diseased foreign threats, and uh, and that these you know we could see this in the the bat meme the bat soup meme and and others, uh, but these were quickly circulated uh, thanks to our. Um, our internet connectivity and the ubiquitous nature of social media um, has, you know, makes these things very um, uh, prolific very quickly. Um, and what we began to see early on um, is uh, discrimination in places where the virus had not even, you know, showed up yet. And uh, and so in a way, you know, it kind of anticipated um, this. Um, this uh, um, increase in um, the, the, the rapid increase in persecution 
and discrimination. Um, and so uh, what I did, you know, with the help of um, and the encouragement of some other colleagues, I began to collect um, uh, newspaper uh, reporting on, um, on discrimination and persecution around the world. And uh, I think in the links to the, to the description, the podcast description is going to be a, um, a resource uh, 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 Google Doc that I edit. Um, and I think it's called Treating Yellow Peril. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a, it contains a lot of links to, um, to newspaper sources, also institutional statements against, um, against uh, um, uh, discrimination um, and a bunch of other resources. But this was my early attempt to kind of capture that historical moment when when the pandemic, when the epidemic was turning into a pandemic and the, the global conversation about an, uh, an Asian racial threat was really developing. Uh, and this is uh, end of January into February. So by the time March comes around, uh, March was is when we started seeing a very different kind of um, narrative in the United States when mm -hmm. cases started to occur. And, um, and then we see a shift uh, in, in politics um, in the United States from a kind of nonchalant, Kind of dismissal of the virus to all of a sudden now it's a Chinese virus. Now it's a um, now it's it's a it's it's an immediate threat. Um, and so um, one thing that that we can see from this is um, is that uh, when the discrimin when the virus was expanding, um, mm -hmm. it one of the most important um, things about that was was its parallels with persecute uh, with persecuting Asians and Asian Americans, uh, and it wasn't until March where we started to see that the virus was really deepening existing inequalities. And that kind of made um, uh, that kind of made the situation more complex because not only do we have violence and protests and harassment of Asian Americans, but that coincides with the horrific disparities in mortality for Black and Native and Latino communities. Um, and so these were, to me, you know, not only that there's persecution persecution for Asian Americans and Asians in general, but that that these were signs that the U.S. is one of the most unequal societies um, and, ha and has been and continues to be structured by white supremacy. And that that's yeah. an important uh, dimension of understanding uh, how the global story gets narrated within the U.S. So I guess that kind of like opens up to our second question. So does it surprise you, you know, when you see those reports of incidents occurring in the areas of um, diverse population or in areas with high portion of um, Asians? Mm, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not surprised. Uh, um, racial politics have never been binary. Um, they've never been just white and other. Um, even though our public conversation usually centers on black-white conflicts, um, other people of color have always been a part of the political calculus. Um, and so, um, you know, when we see um, other kinds of, 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 encounters between Asian Americans and other non-white groups, that that is something to pause on uh, and, and, and contemplate deeply because um, it's important that we not only 
broaden our definition of race relations beyond a kind of black white binary but we need to include others like latinos uh, asian americans uh, and native americans um, but we also have to attend to the intersection of other inequalities such as like class and gender sexuality and religion um, and so when we consider this matrix of identities it gives us a better way to understand how racial politics have shaped our institutions and also you know also being able to see race relations between people of color right so um so one of the things that i noticed in these early reporting is that the media really circulated and also like on twitter and instagram and stuff i saw a lot of uh uh um uh cases where where black and latino attackers were were uh black and latino people were were engaged in attacks or harassment of asian americans and that to my you know while at, on the first hand it was it was alarming to see asian americans being uh, being persecuted in public, um, mm -hmm. but two, uh, I immediately drew a connection to the 1992 LA riots mm -hmm. uh, when, um, when after the verdict uh, exonerating the police, uh, the policeman who brutally beat uh, Rodney King, um, there were there was an uprising in um, in in Los Angeles, but the media turned that uprising into a uh, into a drama about black and Latino grievances against Korean store owners mm -hmm. right and so when when we see those those episodes it has to always be with the backdrop that um, that our politics are saturated with you know with white supremacy and it should come as no surprise that that when people who have been persecuted are now no longer on the bottom that they may choose a an expression of antipathy for some other some other group um that's that's you know i i look at that as a kind of maladaptive way of surviving in um, in a country that is saturated with uh, with conflict, and um, not that it makes it right, but that uh, we have to interpret this um, with with nuance. And I think um, and I think doing so uh, benefits both Asian Americans, but also just the wider public to understand that these are complicated times and, um, and, 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 and to have, um, to ask more questions and be curious. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, you know, bringing up like the entire background of, you know, uh, what might be, you know, uh, like the 1992 um, LA incidents. Um, I think that, that, that kind of gives like a whole background of, you know, of people that why this would be happening and um what what is happening so um so yeah <laughs> yeah no i don't know where they are maybe in the backpack or the cabinet okay. yeah give that a try a just the red backpack okay. sorry about that no no worries <laughs> Love seeing kids. So, um, so I guess kind of like um, kind of circulating back. Have you have you personally experienced anything, you know, and per, um, any discrimination due to the COVID nineteen mm. um, or anything previously? Yeah, uh, I mean, luckily, I have not experienced any violence during the pandemic. Um, I w I would say that I I did grow up in Indiana. Um, and I was the only Asian American in my school for a long time. Um, and so uh, being mixed race and uh, being three generations removed from the immigrant experience, 
uh, I didn't share much with other Asian descended folks um, who were recent immigrants uh, when they did enter my life. So, um, so that was pretty lonely. Um, uh, but you know, one thing to acknowledge is that um, that there are more than a hundred cases of of uh, of attacks, harassment, um, and um, uh, and and other uh, 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 persecution going on daily, and those are just reported incidents. Uh, so you know there. The, when, when we, when, whenever you see a figure about um, uh, rates of persecution or incident reports, uh, those are always undercounted uh, because, as you can imagine, um, you know that kind of treatment um, alienates you and and does make you feel um, uh, like no one is like you don't belong, and those are uh, that's intended to create. Uh, that kind of experience. So, um, uh, so one thing that I have seen though is that people are beginning to uh, record those incidences uh, with their phones, and those those then get circulated socially or on, on social media. Um, and so th that that is an interesting phenomenon to see that um, that occur too. So um, so it's something to to uh, to be aware of. In, I should make a note, um, the resource doc, uh, Treating Yellow Peril, um, has links in there to report incidences. Uh, okay. So if folks have uh, any questions, they, they should check that first. Okay. Yeah, just for our audience, so we'll be posting the link to the, um, the Yellow Fever and Pearl um, in, a, in the chat. Um, so if, you know, it will be um, your resources to use and um, don't worry, we'll, we'll send a link. And um, so I think you kind of touch on like how you personally feel about this. So mm -hmm. we can kind of like jump into the next question is, um, I think you mentioned this before, right? Why, why is not acceptable to call it a Chinese virus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I did want to make one note uh, uh, connecting with the previous question. Um, oh yeah, of course. Uh -huh. Just to uh, just to kind of finish that thought and maybe connect uh -huh. with with some of the other is because I do think the emotional dimension is is important um, mm -hmm. in in the sense that um, you know when when I experienced these things as a kid uh, I was pretty depressed um, and didn't have anyone to share my experiences with um, but later on this kind of depression and alienation later became a kind of resource for me and created bridges. Uh, to connect me with other people, primarily Latinos, um, and and that it, in those connections, I I kind of woke up politically, um, and I so I think connecting to others who share that experience was important uh, because I saw that it was an expression of racial oppression that was meant to keep me out and disengaged, uh, and so um, and so I think you know that uh, that not only is it important to identify the violence that happens and the harassment, but to connect with the emotional dimensions of that because those are those our emotions are how we how we relate to the world and uh, and if we ignore those, we're going to be ignoring uh, these crucial parts of us that connect us to other people. Uh, and I think that's really important in these times now where we're practicing social di distancing and we are separated from each other. Um, I think that emotional connection is really valuable. Um, and I mean, that's something that is, is damaged by the next question. You know, uh, when you, yeah. um, when we, when we see, you know, the language of, the, the Chinese virus or the Asian virus, uh, you know, those are meant to draw lines between people, um, and um, and and that's and 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 it's meant to uh, to divide um, and separate us. Uh, but you know, this is uh, this is an old question. Um, the Chinese. This is not the first time that 
uh, a U.S. president has used the word Chinese virus or that it is circulated in national uh, media. Um, I, I've done some, a little bit of research on, on the presence of, of uh, the uh, of other viral outbreaks um, in 1957 and 1968. Uh, those were two other instances in which uh, in which we had viruses um, originating from some part of Asia uh, that then uh, became um, a kind of alarmist cr uh, cries for uh, for national protection from a foreign threat. Um, and uh, what we see with with our current, you know, uh, president uh, calling this a Chinese virus, it's a real, you know, it's such a, a blatant um, and deliberate attempt to scapegoat China and Asians uh, during this global disaster. Um, and it fits a really well scripted narrative uh, that um, that the GOP uh, and and other uh, politicians have um, have reiterated, and uh, it's it's as a historian, it's incredible to see the kinds of parallels historically. Uh, this almost the same language, almost the same talking points, um, and so you know when we see this kind of language uh, attaching an ethnicity or a geography to the virus. Um, you know, it's meant to be a distortion and a distraction. Um, uh, but, you know, calling it uh, a, a Chinese virus and, and bringing these kinds of racial politics into the pandemic is really dangerous. Um, I mean, one, you know, there, there's three main ways that racism makes pandemics worse. You know, the first is that it, um, it can distract doctors and medical officials from the real biological and epidemiological um, uh, uh, features of the virus. Um, and so for instance, you know, we have like the Surgeon General telling people of color to lay off drugs and alcohol, um, as, you know, as a, a way to, uh, to protect the African American community um, or the, the Latino community. And, um, and you know, this is a misplaced understanding about about how how to treat the pandemic, um, and really blaming the victim, um, and related to that is the second dimension of persecuting victims. Per, you know, in this case, we're talking about Asian Americans, um, which adds violence on top of the risks of infection. Right. So um, so now um, uh, you know when when you have the persecution of of victims, you also see a decrease in their likelihood of seeking care. Uh, and so when they do ha have medical needs, they're reluctant to do so because, uh, reluctant in seeking them out because they're, they may be afraid of, of an attack. Um, and, uh, and then lastly, you know, uh, attaching this kind of racial idea to the virus uh, really supports these myths of racial immunity, uh, and um, and so I think some of this is connected to the uh, the protests against social distancing, um, and this uh, an idea that if if this is indeed you know if you believe that it is a Chinese virus, then uh, then perhaps that white people uh, don't have anything to worry about, uh, and and by by making these kinds of lines. You uh, you desensitize people to uh, the seriousness of this, and um, and it's just what what all of this means is that uh, it will prolong the pandemic and worsen its consequences. Um, and then when when you have that, you just have this negative feedback loop that uh, that gets worse uh, because um, you know as the situation uh, becomes more uh, dire the stronger there is an investment in uh, scapegoating. And, uh, and this is the pathology of white supremacy. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so I, we do have a question from the audience, which is actually perfectly lining up with our next question. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, so, so our next question is gonna be, 
idea of uh, model uh, minority. I think this stereotype has been around for a while. And um, how, what, what do you think? How does this stereotype play a role in mm. the current situation? And thank you, Jeffrey, for bringing up this question too. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the model minority uh, stereotypes is, is important to remember in this period because um, this is when Asian Americans have shifted in the public imaginary from, say, like crazy rich Asians to crazy sick Asians. And we're living in the midst of that transformation. Um, and I think one of the things that it shows is that uh, is how thinly uh, supported or how, how hollow the claims to a kind of post-racial um, you know, identity or post-racial politics that the model minority sort of suggested, right? Um, one of the ideas behind the model minority is that it, um, it, it says that, that, that some people don't need to, yeah, that's good. That some people don't need to uh, need to worry about um, about say affirmative action or other policies because Asian Americans have succeeded, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so um, you know the model minority is an idea that's always been a part of U.S. Asian racial formations um, that's always connected the this kind of positive image with a negative image of the yellow peril oh this, these are my notes um and so but what what has happened is that um this idea of the, this kind of positive idea uh, about asian americans was codified into a narrative of national inclusion um during the cold war and um and it basically supported the idea that um, that Asian Americans um, were were quiet and successful people, uh, 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 people of color that Blacks and Latinos should strive to replicate, and that was the narrative during the Cold War. Uh, and so we've we've seen this as you know continue after the Cold War um, as uh, as a kind of um, as a kind of uh, you know everyday image of say like the, um, um, you know, that has been supported by immigration policies, right? So uh, immigration policies have, have been in place such that Asian Americans are now uh, the, the fastest growing uh, racial group um, in, and, uh, and that the majority of those immigrants uh, are, um, are already have a uh, high education and um, and uh, and come with some means and so uh, so it you know it becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy uh, but underwritten beneath that is the fact that that there isn't a, a strong investment in uh, in the actual problems of Asian Americans right and so the model minority myth often silences those problems um, and you know, one of the consequences of this is uh, this has distanced Asian Americans from other people of color, uh, and initiated a kind of you know what I like to think of as a kind of intergenerational amnesia about the history of Asian American racial oppression and persecution. If if Asian Americans believe in the yellow, in in the model minority, then they may dismiss the past as irrelevant. Um, and that it no longer, you know, is is important to them, or maybe even considered a liability. Um, you know, that if if they bring up this this bad past, it may disrupt their image as uh, as a well-to-do or um, or a successful um, um, person. Um, but you know, we see that this the we see how hollow the claims to the model minority are. When um, when we see that such a dramatic uh, shift uh, to a kind of yellow peril status, um, and so when some Asian Americans invested in model in the model minority image, they distanced themselves from um, from other people of color and the struggles against racial oppression. So now, when Asian Americans call out persecution and ask for solidarity, we see other groups justifiably point out the hypocrisy. 
Um, but one thing that I've seen is the enormous and widespread solidarity from diverse organizations and institutions to stand out against anti-Asian persecution. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, so I think there's a second part um, of the question to Jeffrey. Um, we will circulate back to uh, what can you do as an individual because that's actually part of our questions mm -hmm. that too. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you are a professor from University of Connecticut. And mm -hmm. um, why do you think, you know, um, studying Asian American history mm -hmm. is important to you? Mm -hmm. And um, what lessons can we learn from history to prevent something, you know, from this from happening again in the future? Yeah, yeah. I mean, first, uh, I think it's important to study Asian American history because we're just we're just getting started. We're just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. The field of Asian American studies is only fifty to sixty years old, uh, and historians have just you know it's just been two generations of of historians doing this kind of work. Um, so we have a lot to learn, and a lot of stories have not been told yet. Uh, and so um, that's why I, I, I think of this as a rich and growing field. Um, and uh, with that said, you know, the lessons that can teach us about our, our current moment have been published for the last 40 years. You know, so I think it's, it's telling that many Asian Americans and even well-educated public commentators, and, you know, to be honest, I get, I get, media requests probably two to three three times a week and journalists ask me the same questions they're why is this happening what are the earlier precedents for this happening um and these the answers have been published for 40 years but um uh but you know th there there isn't a kind of widespread or even public kind of knowledge of the basic outlines of Asian American legal and political history. Uh, and so, you know, when I think about those, uh, those cases, you know, I, I try to imagine, you know, what are the other, um, excuse me, oh, can I have, can I share this, this space with you? Yeah. Um, uh, um, you know, so I think about the ways that Asian American studies is siloed in the university uh, and that we often think of it just as uh, as a humanities uh, kind of addition, right, or a kind of um, extra credit in, in a humanities uh, curriculum. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that this, epi this pandemic is showing us is that um, is that ethnic studies in general and Asian American studies in particular uh, is, um, is, is not only insightful to understanding politics, uh, but it also is a way of practicing good public health and, um, and, and needs to be a part of broader conversations outside of just literature or history, um, that these are things that are relevant to lots of different folks. Um, and so, um, uh, one of the, if I could just, you know, kind of tell a little bit about what we're doing at University of Connecticut. Um, one of the projects I've started as director of the Institute is to try and develop partnerships with the other colleges. So for instance, the, or other schools. Um, so for instance, like the School of Nursing, uh, they try and develop uh, uh, parallel degree programs where you can, uh, uh, major in nursing and minor in Asian American studies, um, or uh, in the field of education, um, or uh, if you're getting a small business degree, uh, that you would then you could also minor in Asian American studies. Um, and so I think there's a real need to uh, integrate Asian American study, studies and ethnic studies in general with other professional degree programs. Um, and I think there's uh, you know, we see the relevance here, uh, but also the marketability that people who have specializations, you know, can um, can can really, you know, do some good. Um, and you know, part of one of one of the things that I've done to try to expand the audience for Asian American studies is to produce more work that's publicly engaged. Um, so one one example of that is uh, a zine I wrote with. Um, with this organization called 18 Million Rising. 
And I think that you're going to link to that in yes. um, uh, in the blog uh, in the um, the description. So um, so that'll be a resource for folks to look at too. Uh, that kind of connects this history with our current situation in a real accessible way uh, that it includes like visuals and some artwork um, and uh, and really just tries to um, to draw out those immediate kind of historical and political connections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, just for the audience, we will be sharing these resources uh, throughout this um, conversation. So if you are interested in any of the resources, please, please um, take a look at the chat and uh, we'll be posting, we'll be posting them. And um, so um, kind of join, jumping back to our question, um, I think you shared um, a lot about this already. I don't know if you have anything else to add to it, you know, because mm -hmm. you talk about like 1992 LA riot, you talk about like the model the uh, minority model, uh, model minority, but uh, I don't know, do you have anything else to add to this question? Like, can mm. you share any potential yeah. reasons why Asians are experiencing this um, discrimination due to mm -hmm. COVID-19? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the things to keep in mind about what's happening right now is is so much of, of this, the discussion about the pandemic is couched in national conversations in which xenophobia has is, is, is turned into a kind of global phenomenon. It's not just the U.S. that has xenophobic politics uh, that win elections. Uh, India, um, England, France, um, there are a number of other countries in which xenophobia is a, is a political engine. And uh, and so I think you know the 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 pandemic and the scapegoating of Asians and Asian Americans uh, it fits fits you know right to the hand of this kind of uh, dominant political narrative, um, and so um, while um, you know one of the things that I think which makes our experience in the U.S particularly kind of punctuated at this moment is that Americans have been practicing this kind of persecution on Muslims and Latinos and Jews, trans people, disabled people. This behavior is not new. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, what, I, you know, from one of my favorite basketball commentators who always talks about like seeing, uh, seeing a new player develop confidence, you know, he always says, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dick Van Gundy, I think, is his name. Um, uh, but he always says confidence comes from successful repetition, and I think in this case, you know, Americans have successfully repeated this campaign of persecution against different people, uh, and so the current administration has made Americans confident in their racism now, uh, confident from repetition. Uh, from Muslims to Latinos to Jews, um, and it's imperative that we stick up for ourselves uh, and stick up for others who, uh, for our own health, safety, and survival. Um, but you know, we also need to practice this, um, uh, practice a politics of peace and justice and equity, um, so that we can move forward with a different kind of confidence. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for adding um, more to this questions. Mm -hmm. um, so now we are kind of circulating back to the audience question. Um, so our final question of the day would be, um, so this was drafted before we sent out to the um, all the health um, sci science health co uh, colleges. But mm -hmm. so as a as a future healthcare profession, or as pharmacists, as nurses, doctors, or any individual, if we encounter discrimination from patient. Um, how can we react and respond in a professional manner? Mm. And is there anything we can do in the future as an individual to prevent this from happening again? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm a doctor of history uh, and, um, and, and ethnic studies. So, uh, so I, I should couch my recommendations that I do not have medical training um, mm. or certification. <laughs> uh, but I think um, I think there's a couple things that make sense. First off, uh, protect yourself. Um, you know, even, even, you know, when you're flying in, in, um, 
in airplanes, right? You know, remember when we see the um, the brochure that says if there's an emergency and the masks come down, remember? And you put, you know, parents put the mask on first and then help help the kids, right? And so I think that's the same way. You have to protect yourself. Uh, you encounter a, a situation where you don't feel safe. Um, you need to protect yourself. You need to get other people involved. Um, this isn't something that uh, you should feel ashamed about uh, or something that you should hide from other people. Uh, this is something that um, that um, that is about you serving people and, um, and you have to stay safe too. Um, and so I also think um, that uh, we have, uh, in, in this particular uh, moment, um, healthcare professionals have an obligation to speak the truth um, because there is so much misinformation. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a real need to address the myths of miracle cures and untested medicines um, and those those need to be addressed head on um, because you know just like the you know I said earlier misinformation uh, will make the pandemic worse uh, and being physicians or pharmacists or healthcare professionals uh, you're going to be um, facing people who are going to be asking questions about these myths and other uh, other problematic uh, things. So I think it's important to um, to speak the truth and not to um, just avoid uh, saying that these are myths, uh, but that I think it's important that people know uh, the the currency of the information they're 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 using. Um, and you know, also I think um, if you're in count, you know, as as someone who studies racism and expressions of racial violence. Uh, when it comes to one-on-one -on -one encounters, um, that is different than, I would say different than, say, uh, a kind of street encounter where maybe you have a mass politics involved or you have uh, a kind of spontaneous collection of people who are maybe attacking someone um, or that discrimination happens as, as a part of institutions or, you know, like, um, uh, um, you know, ICE raids, right, um, immigration raids. Um, but I think the interpersonal one is particularly troubling because it usually indicates uh, an underlying psychological issue. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind too, um, that as uh, healthcare professionals, um, you guys will be confronted with questions of addressing your patient's health. And, uh, and so I think one thing to keep in mind is, is that um, psychologically, racism is, uh, is a way of solving a problem, right? If someone is, uh, is trying, to, is, um, is being aggressive, right, it's usually, a maladaptive way of solving a problem that they perceive, right? So it may not actually be directed at you, but some other kind of um, psychological condition. Uh, and that that's an expression of that underlying condition. Um, when it's in the public, it has a different kind of resonance. And I'm sure there's all kinds of psychological issues going on. But in a particular kind of intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with a doctor, and you have that kind of um, you, you have that kind of encounter, um, that could be another indication of um, of something you might want to uh, follow up on in a different context or with with added help. Um, so that that that's something that I I would offer. Again, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not licensed. I'm a historian. Uh, and I look at that this uh, this stuff um, in the past, and um, but I, I I do think that it's relevant in these, and I I I would appreciate any other uh, um, uh, uh, corrections from real medical doctors uh, if I've, mm -hmm. if I've mis made any missteps. Okay.
Yeah, I, lo I love the example of how you are saying that the uh, the face mask on the airplane. I think that's a very important message to be delivered. You know, you have to take care of yourself in order to take care of others. Mm -hmm, so, absolutely. Um, that's that's our last question. Um, we have prepared. Now we are actually opening up to the floor. If any audience have any um, question that was unaddressed, um, so. Um, does uh, if you do, please post right now because we are actually approaching to the the end of this discussion. And um, I've seen uh, Michelle, um, one of another um, coordinator of this event. Um, they have been posting the uh, the resources um, Dr. Chan was talking about. Uh, Dr. Chan, could you um, kind of just I know you have mentioned this, but can you just kind of brief go over the resources we have been posted, like what they're used for, like what um, mm -hmm. what can we get off from the resources? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the Google Doc, uh, Treating Yellow uh -huh. Barrel, uh, I, I, I made that in um, uh, as a resource for other people, um, other educators uh, to draw from, uh, but also put, um, put resources that they find. It's, a, it's an open source document. So if you find um, uh, uh, resources uh, or news reporting uh, or historical cases that you find interesting, uh, or useful, please post them there. Um, uh, the, there's been a lot of traffic to this site. Um, uh, there's a number of courses that are using it currently. Um, and um, uh, and so there's uh, the, uh, another thing you can find that there's some sample assignments um, that, that other uh, instructors can use uh, to help process the pandemic experience um and I, you know i should say that the that the google doc um resource is really about focusing in on anti-asian persecution anti-asian racism it's not a clearing house of information on covid19 this is really directed at racism and institutional okay. responses to it um, and news reporting of it um, and reports on um, on incidences. Okay, and okay, awesome. And uh, I guess we don't. I don't see any um, question from the audience. And uh, I really, we really appreciate your presence today, as well as your baby girl who is part of this uh, conversation <laughs> for the majority of the time. She she also show up at the right time, you know, for the face mask. Uh, yeah, I know. So, right I know. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, we really appreciate your um your presence today. And uh, if we don't have any questions, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, stay safe, stay up to date. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you, everyone, for 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 attending today. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, chance to to talk with you. And thanks for this. Yeah, thank you. And uh, for uh, we're gonna have our episode seven this week as well, but that's gonna be uh, more on literature review of um, COVID nineteen. Uh, mm -hmm. So if anyone has any interest in that, so please feel free to join us this Thursday. It's gonna be at the same time. Um, it's during the during the lunch hour. And uh, thank you again, Dr. John, for joining us today. And mm -hmm. uh, stay safe. Yeah, you too. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.